Welcome back to AP Chemistry with Mrs. Mays. We're working on acid-base equilibrium in this unit and today we're going to talk about what does it mean to be strong and what does it mean to be weak. We're doing calculations with Ka and Kb. So to know if something is a strong acid or a weak acid or a strong base or a weak base, we have to calculate the value for the ion dissociation for that substance. Because what we're really talking about is how many particles of ions, charged particles, do we get when that stuff gets in the water. So the acid has a value called Ka, which is the acid dissociation constant. The ratio of the concentration of the dissociated form of the acid to the undissociated form or its molecular form when it's all bonded together still. Strong acids will completely ionize in solution so they're called strong acids just as they would have been called strong electrolytes because they make the most ions in aqueous solutions. Weak acids will only partially ionize in aqueous solutions and the stronger the bond is for the hydrogen and its anion, the weaker the acid tends to be. For a base, we use the term called Kb, the base dissociation constant, which gives us the ratio of the product, the conjugate acid and the hydroxide ion concentrations, to the concentration of the conjugate base, or basically the undissociated base. Of course, a strong base dissociates completely into the metal ions and the hydroxide ions in aqueous solutions. So this would be your group 1 metals and then calcium, barium, and strontium. Those are your strong bases. Everything else is a weak base. And weak bases will react with water to form hydroxide ions and the conjugate acid of that base, but they don't completely break apart. So here's a question for you. I've got four particle diagrams. Which of these particle diagrams represents a strong acid? So if this is our acid where the little black dot is the hydrogen ion, then the anion would be, we'll call it A minus, and this is our acid HA, then when it's a strong acid, it breaks apart completely so that there's no more HA left. We get hydrogen ions separate, completely separated from the anion. They're not together anymore. This picture shows some of these still together, so it can't be this one. And here are some that are still attached, so it can't be B. And look, C still has some of these particles stuck together. That's not okay. That means it's not a strong acid. But in D, it's easy to see that all of those molecules have completely broken apart. That one is indeed the strong acid. You need to memorize the eight strong acids because that will help you to understand what's going to take place when it gets dissolved in water. These are the acids that completely dissociate in water and anything else that's not on this list is not considered a strong acid. So these are the ones to memorize. Everything else is weak. So instead of memorizing all of them, just memorize the strong ones. To write a Ka expression, we write it like an equilibrium expression where we put the products over the reactants. So it will look like this. Ka equals, let's see, I have this ion and this ion in my products. So hydronium is H3O plus and chloride, Cl minus. And that's all over the reactants. So I'll put HCl in here because that one is aqueous, but I'm not going to put water in there because liquids do not get to be in the equilibrium expression. So there's the Ka, there's the Ka for hydrochloric acid. Similarly, when we have a weak acid, we would write the Ka expression the same way. So I put hydronium ions on top along with the conjugate base of my weak acid, Hc. CH3COO, that's called ethanoate, 
And then my ethanoic acid goes on the bottom, also known as acetic acid. And then water doesn't get to be in the expression because it's a liquid and liquids don't go in um, equilibrium expressions. So the Ka indicates the fraction of the acid that exists in its ionized form. Weak acids have smaller Ka values. And the stronger the acid, the larger the Ka value will be because the more ions we get, right? Especially hydrogen ions. The Kb expression is what we use when we don't make hydrogen, but rather when we make hydroxide ions. So if you have an equation with hydroxide as your product, you don't write a Ka, we write a Kb. So I put products over reactants, ammonium ions times hydroxide ions on the top, divided by the reactant side. I have ammonia and I have water, and water doesn't get to play because it's a liquid. So it's always going to be your conjugate acid times the hydroxide over your conjugate base for the Kb. The Kb tells us how the weak bases will compete for the hydroxide from a strong base. The smaller the value of Kb, the, sm the weaker the base. And the, of course, the larger the Kb, the stronger the base. Here's an example of a base called pyridine. Pyridine is a base because the nitrogen has these electrons that hydrogen ions are attracted for. So I would write what pyridine does. So we'll just use its name. Pyridine in water is going to steal hydrogen ions away from the water. So we'll call it H-pyridine. And then the hydroxide ions are left behind. Remember hyd hydrogen hydroxide is our water, right? So if these guys transfer over to the pyridine, I'm left with hydroxide all alone floating around in the solution. How many hydroxides will we have floating around in the solution? Well, if I start with a four molar solution of pyridine, then this is starting to look like a rice table, isn't it? So I have four molar pyridine and I have water not included and nothing has broken apart yet until it starts to dissolve in the water. Then I lose some of my pyridine as I form H-pyridine and I form hydroxide ions. So I get 4 minus X here, X and X. So the Kb is going to be um, H-pyridine concentration times hydroxide ion concentration all over my initial, or no, my equilibrium concentration of pyridine. And according to my equilibrium table, my rice table, I get x times x on the top and 4 minus x on the bottom. Now how big do you think x is going to be? If the value of Kb is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 9, then we can fairly assume that x is really tiny and for minus x is not going to be a measurable difference. So I take my x here and get rid of it. So I have x squared over 4 equals 1.7 times 10 to the minus 9 and solving for x, let's just figure it out. So I need to take 1.7 times 10 to the minus 9, multiply by 4, and then take the square root of that whole thing. So that's our plan. The square root of 1.7 times 10 to the negative 9 times 4. And I get 8.246 times 10 to the minus 5 is the value for X, but X represents the hydroxide ion concentration, right? So I haven't answered the question yet. I need to calculate the pH. So my next step is the pOH, because I have hydroxide ion concentration. So let's take the negative log 
of my x, the negative log of my answer, <clears throat> and I get 4.08, and of course I need to find the pH, so pH is 14 minus pOH. So what's that difference going to be? And I'm kind of lazy, so I just subtract 14. Ignore that sign. pH is 9.9. .9. Does that make sense that our pH is greater than 7? Well, since our pH is greater than 7, I suspect this is a base. And indeed, pyridine is basic. So this answer makes sense. Always ask yourself, do I get something that's reasonable or not? So that's how we work with Ka and Kb, and we can put it in a rice table and work out anything we need to. We'll see you guys in class.